That's right. So my name is Melissa O'Connor. I'm an assistant professor here at Villanova and also a member of the lectureship series committee. And I'd like to start by giving our thanks to the Narratil family who have generously supported uh, the Health and Human Values lecture series. I would also like to remind all of you that this is ACS approved. Mm -hmm. So we're delighted to welcome this evening's guest speaker, okay. particularly because she is one of our own. Susan Fretz Paparella is a Villanova graduate owning birth, both her BSN and MSN degrees from Villanova and is a recipient of the highly regarded College of Nursing's medallion for her distinguished contributions to clinical practice. Susan has dedicated most of her professional nursing career to promoting safe <coughs> medication practices and educating healthcare professionals on how to include these practices in their own organizations. Susan is currently the Vice President of the Institute for Safe Medication Practices located in nearby Horsham, Pennsylvania. Susan is a national and international leader and advocate for medication safety who uses her comprehensive knowledge to influence practice change and improve patient outcomes. So please join me in welcoming back to Villanova. <laughs> Susan right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa and everyone uh, for coming this evening. This is like, what a turnout. Holy cow. Um, I have to admit, too, I'm also a Villanova parent right now. I have a senior, Alex, and a freshman, Shannon. So if anybody uh, knows them, please say hello to them. Tell them mom was here and uh, picking up their laundry or whatever I'm supposed to do as a good, as a good mom. Um, but I'm very excited to be here tonight. Can you speak loud? Yes. Okay. I'm very excited to be here tonight because um, I get to talk to a very, uh, uh, my favorite group of individuals, which are nurses. I don't always get to speak to nurses, um, but tonight uh, will be a special night for me. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, how we're going to empower nurses beyond the five rights. And uh, many of you probably know those five rights, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. I have nothing to disclose about some of the products or some of the uh, medications that I may show you tonight. No, no disclosures to have. But tonight my objectives are, again, to describe to you um, what, where we are with medication safety. What is the scope of the problem um, in the United States and internationally? And uh, what we as nurses can do, um, how we can be empowered to make changes to prevent those very serious and fatal, even fatal medication errors that happen very commonly um, across our country. I also want to talk to you quickly about the role of the, um, the organization in which I work, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. And hopefully some of you are familiar with this organization. Um, and if not, um, after tonight, hopefully you will be, and you will um, be a, a follower of some of our information and use that information in a, in a positive way. Um, and lastly, um, uh, hopefully we'll have some little dialogue at the, at the end if we have time. And um, I'd like to hear about some of your experiences, too, around medication safety and the challenges that you are experiencing uh, both in your workplace and maybe as a student. So let me first start about ISMP. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit public charity. Uh, we are also a federally certified patient safety organization. So what that means is we get information in about uh, serious and confidential events from around the country, and we have uh, certain federal protections about how we uh, handle that data and use that information and that patient safety work product. We also have some obligations then to uh, give back to the organizations that share information with us uh, to help them improve safety. We are international in scope, as mentioned. We have an ISMP Spain, an ISMP Canada, and an ISMP Brazil, all sister organizations uh, like ISMP. But the difference with those organizations is that they are funded uh, primarily by their governments uh, at, as they have some socialized medicine and other types of uh, funding uh, opportunities that we don't have here at ISMP. We are, again, self-funded. So we. Um, provide our continued services uh, to the public uh, through educational programs that we put on, consultation we do with hospitals, et cetera. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But basically our mission is really to advance patient safety worldwide by empowering practitioners like yourselves, uh, nurses, pharmacists, physicians, uh, to really um, enhance the safety of medication use and prevent medication errors. 
Uh, we, uh, I should tell you probably a little bit of the background. Our president, Michael Cohen, was actually uh, one of the first clinical pharmacists here in, the, in um, Pennsylvania. He worked at a Temple University hospital in the city, and this was back in the 70s. And at that time, he had a very smart mentor who was encouraging him to, again, grow in his professionalism and had him start to write some articles for a column. And the column actually was in a, a journal called Hospital Pharmacy, and it's actually still uh, in, in publication today, and he still writes that column, believe it or not. Uh, but at the time, he chose to write about something that was very familiar to him. And he, they had recently had an error on his clinical unit, and it involved the use of insulin. And uh, in the handwritten order, it said for you. So they used the abbreviation U to indicate units. But what happened in the error was it was, it was uh, interpreted as 40 units of insulin. So the patient got a tenfold overdose of insulin. Um, very you know, scary situation and certainly something that required a lot of intervention on behalf of, of the patient. But it actually um, was sort of an interesting time for um, Dr. Cohen because uh, you can imagine back in the 70s, it wasn't the type of culture in healthcare where you could talk about problems and errors like we do today. So there was a lot of fear about him publishing something like this and sort of telling about a problem at the hospital. Um, but the, the surprising thing was he got a lot of feedback, and it was positive feedback from other clinical practitioners and, and nurses and pharmacists around the country who wrote to him and said, we had that same error happen. We had that same situation with the U and a tenfold overdose, or they told him they had other types of medication errors. And that actually was the impetus for the program that we now run today, which is the National Errors Reporting Program. It's different than the other uh, reporting programs around the country because it's not a program that uh, hospitals or health systems would uh, pay money to or like a proprietary program where they would do a big data dump of errors into. No, it's a practitioner-based error reporting program. So folks just like yourselves, nurses, pharmacists, physicians, report errors to us. They tell us their stories. They tell us what happened. Uh, we're able to communicate with them directly and learn about the other things that contributed to those errors. And uh, we think it makes for a much richer understanding of medication errors and the things that we can do to prevent them. What we do with that information is a variety of things. Giving talks is one of them. Um, another one that most people know us for are our newsletters. And these are the five newsletters that we produce. Uh, the bottom right, on your right, is the acute care edition of the newsletter. It comes out every two weeks. And it's been uh, coming out since in the mid-90s. Um, Without, without a miss. Um, we talk about, again, stories and errors that we hear about from individuals and uh, describe for people what those recommendations would be for uh, preventing those errors from happening. The top right, I also call to your attention the nurse advisor. And the reason I do is a free publication. Um, and so if you don't receive this, please go to our website, which is www.ismp.org. Um, and this is, comes out monthly. And it's, again, good information about practice issues and things that you can um, then use in, in, as you, you know, in your daily work. So let's talk about the scope of medication errors as a problem. For those of you that, are, uh, that know the safety literature and have been involved in uh, looking at articles around safety, you'll recognize the IOM statistics. And they were out about 1999 or so when that report was released. And that report was called To Air is Human. And that told us between 44 and 98,000 people die each year from preventable medical error. And at that time when that report came out, uh, individuals were sort of surprised and they thought that that can't be true. That number is way too high. But we know now that that number is actually way too low. Um, there's a lot that we know about errors and, and how they're reported. And we know that only about 3 to 5 percent of errors that happen actually get reported. Uh, because there's a lot of things that, that challenge us in reporting, not because people are trying to hide something, but sometimes we don't understand that the reason for our patient's uh, challenges are really because of an error and not because of their disease process. So there's a lot that we don't know about error. But some more later statistics um, from the Office of the Inspector General uh, from Health and Human Services back in 2010 told us one in seven Medicare recipients have a medical error uh, every year, and about 180,000 die. So that's a really significant amount of individuals that are being affected every, every year because of the challenges that uh, are faced within our healthcare systems. 
The other um, reporting system I want to tell you about, because we are located here in Pennsylvania, and we're very um, proud of this, this uh, program, actually, was uh, the Patient Safety Authority that exists in Pennsylvania that came um, about by, um, through a, an MCARE Act, which was passed in 2002, and that required all hospitals and surgery centers and ambulatory uh, settings and birthing centers in Pennsylvania to do several things. One is that they had to establish a patient safety officer, someone who really had oversight of their uh, patient issues, their quality issues, and really would drive quality to a higher level. The other thing that's unique about this in Pennsylvania is that we require reporting of all medical error to the authority. Uh, and that is a little different than other states. Other states require the reporting of serious events. But in Pennsylvania, they had the forethought to say, you know what, everything that happens and maybe doesn't reach the patient or cause serious harm is also important because it helps us understand our systems in which we work and helps us to um, maybe learn what's contributing to our problems instead of waiting until the error reaches a point at which someone is harmed. So I ask you, we have at ISMP have the ability then in the last little over 10 years to look at all the medication errors that have come from this reporting system in Pennsylvania. And I wonder if anyone wants to take a guess about how many errors that might be just in Pennsylvania alone. Anyone? Okay. I don't know if this number, whoops, I'm sorry about that. Will surprise you or not? Over 500,000 errors. Now think about that. That's in Pennsylvania. So you can take, you imagine, you know, doing the math, what we're really talking about in terms of, of events across this country. Very, very concerning um, information. So we all recognize who this is, and certainly um, it is pretty amazing about the way in which uh, Florence Nightingale had um, thoughts that really transcend time in terms of the nursing care that we provide. And he was a pioneer for cleanliness and hygiene and organizational systems, and she actually was someone who thought about safety a long time ago. And certainly it is our duty and our, our belief that we should do the patient no harm. But we do have these perceptions in health and in health in nursing and healthcare um, that sometimes I actually probably should call these misperceptions. These are things that actually um, nurses have over the years believed, and actually I can tell you they still do believe today in some uh, cases. So, um, like the uh, perception that nurses actually make more errors than other practitioners. Um, anybody believe that that's true? Okay. So why do you think that, it, why do you think people believe that? So I can tell you it's because nurses really do the best job at reporting errors, right? So when you look at that big database of reporting, the nurses are the ones that are saying, hey, you know, this happened. Let's, let's write it down. Let's get it reported. Let's, you know, make sure that someone gets this information because we are the advocates for the patient. We are really there trying to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again. But the perception then of other types of practitioners, pharmacists who are gathering this data and collecting this data, often will say, well, geez, but, you know, we do these nice pie graphs and we send it off to administration to show how we're doing in medication safety, the administrators say, well, geez, why all the nurses? Why are there more of the errors in nursing than they are in pharmacy and physicians? And it's just because we do do better reporting. How about the fact if we make an error, but it doesn't reach the patient? Is that still an error? Okay, sure, sure it is. And again, I mentioned how important it is to learn from those, those issues that happen. Um, and in the years past, we've often had the, the impetus to sort of push that underneath the rug. And, and, you know, we didn't want to talk about those sort of things that happened because somehow maybe others would think we weren't a good practitioner if, if that error occurred. Also, if nurses um, would be more careful, do you think that errors would go away? Okay, probably not, right? Nurses are, um, you know, by, by nature, nurses are careful. That's what we're taught to be, right? In everything we do, we're, we have such attention to detail, but yet those errors are still going to happen, and that's because we are human beings, we're working in very complex systems, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And the last one I just want to mention to you is certainly, this is definitely a misperception, that good nurses don't make mistakes. And we know that, unfortunately, good nurses do make mistakes every day. So one of those misperceptions I think I just want to get out on the table right now is the whole understanding that the error wouldn't have happened if the nurse would have followed the five rights. Okay. Are there still only five rights? 
six, seven, eight, nine, every, uh, different hospitals we go to, there's different numbers of rights. And certainly there's a, 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 a value to the rights in that it helps the nurse have some methodology around how she's approaching that task of medication delivery. But I'm here to um, help you understand that telling someone to follow the five rights is more or less like telling them, you just, just be more careful next time. Just, you know what, if you did it, if you just followed the five rights, somehow that error wouldn't happen. And unfortunately, we've had too many errors reported to us at ISP where we recognize that the nurse did everything she could, to, he, she could, to follow the five rights, but in fact, the error still occurred. Uh, so this is actually um, a more recent error. In December 2014, an emergency department nurse followed the five rights, hung an infusion of phosphenatoin that was prepared by the pharmacy. And although it was labeled phosphenatoin, the infusion was actually prepared with rocuronium, which is a neuromuscular blocker and a paralyzing agent. Um, so what was really unfortunate about this particular event was there were other things that contributed to the death of this patient. And one thing was the patient should have been on a cardiac monitor. It was ordered for the patient, but the nurse hadn't gotten around to getting it um, hooked to the patient yet. And unfortunately, as things happen in these types of events, um, right about the time the nurse hung the infusion, the fire alarm went off. So the, the rest of the staff did as they are typically told to do in a, in a case of a fire alarm. They walked around, they closed the doors. So this patient then was behind a closed door, not on a cardiac monitor, and was being administered a paralyzing agent. So you can imagine what happened when they got back and opened the door, this patient was unable to be resuscitated. So again, it's, these are these situations that happen where the five rights just don't protect us. They're just not, not there for us. And it, it happens more than I can tell you. Um, tragic events that we hear about that are in the media every day, and even ones that aren't in the media, but they are there and they are happening. And what I'm hoping to help you understand tonight is that because of the complexity of the medication use process, it's gonna take more than us just following the five rights. We need to be thinkers, we need to be critical about the work we do, we need to use our, all of our um, learning that we've had, not only in school, but our experiences in the clinical workplace to really be analytical about our approach to medication safety. And the first way we start some of this is just making sure that we're all aligned in our beliefs about safety and quality and risk. And what is it we believe? Well, ISMP is um, very much a proponent of a model of accountability called Just Culture. And Just Culture is sort of somewhere in between where we used to be, very punitive when an error happened and people would get fired and, and, and other bad things would happen. And then we didn't like that model. That didn't feel good to us in healthcare. So then we sort of drifted to the other extreme where we said, you know, that's okay. It was a system issue. Nobody was really accountable. Um, but yet when errors continue to happen, people were calling for accountability and saying, you know, we just can't have it that no one's accountable when something happens. So we need to be somewhere in between. And that is this model of just culture. And so within this model, there are three beliefs. And I think you'll agree with, with all of them. Um, they're pretty straightforward. The first one is to err is human. Uh, and we know that's pretty much the case. Um, there's not a whole lot to say on that other than, you know, as long as nurses are involved in the delivery of medications, we're human and things are going to happen. Uh, we're never going to be able to prevent all errors from happening. These are the slips, the lapses, the mistakes, the things we, the problems we have every day. The second type of belief is a little bit more complicated, but I think you'll also appreciate this too. It's called drift. And drift is, is much more of a behavioral choice, if you will, where human error is, is just not explainable. It's something that happens without our understanding and knowledge. But drift, again, is a behavioral choice. So in this example, um, there's two pictures here. The one on the top left is Steve Irwin. I don't know if any of you recognize him. Um, but you may actually recall this event. It was pretty big on the media at the time when he took his young son into the area where he was training the alligators. And uh, you know there was a big firestorm in the media back then. And people were saying, how could he be so irresponsible and you know, put his child in harm's way? So about the same time, there was another event uh, similar, and it was Britney Spears with her, ch her son on her lap. And I don't know if you remember that, but again, it was all about the same. You were hearing in the media, you know, what bad parents, you know, how can they make these kind of decisions? But I can tell you that probably neither of these two folks 
got up that morning and said, I'm going to put my child in harm's way. These people had a different perception of the risk. And that happens for a lot of reasons. Sometimes you have a changed perception of risk just because you live in that environment every day and nothing bad ever happens. So think about it when you are driving on the turnpike, for example, and the speed limit is 55, and I know you all go 55, right? Yeah. right? So then you go 65 and everyone else is passing you, right? So then you're going 70. And you do that every day, and you never get pulled over by the police, and you never have an accident, and everything is fine. So your perception of the risk of going over the speed limit has been altered. And that's sort of what happened in these particular situations. And I think that's what happens in healthcare too. And I want to tell you about some other risky practices. Uh, we're going to talk about a variety of them, but certainly what we're talking about here are at-risk behaviors. So what are these behaviors that we see in nursing and in healthcare that we've sort of drifted beyond what we know to be a safe place. And these would be things like using unlabeled syringes on patients when we, we're pretty sure we know what's in it or we, you know, we just didn't take the time to label it. Or how about overriding some of the safety um, devices that we have, the smart infusion pumps, and not using the drug libraries that are part of the systems to make us safer. And sometimes we take these, these risks and these chances because the, um, the benefit, if you will, um, if for some reason seems better at that moment. So we're maybe weighing efficiency and safety. So we feel we have to get our work done faster, and so we discard the safety value and take on the value of efficiency. So sometimes we have to weigh those hard values, and drift is one of those things that happens in healthcare and in nursing uh, pretty regularly. I can tell you too, we know that human error happens in error, and we do see human error sometimes, and we do see negligent behavior, which is the third type of behavior, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, but that's the extreme behavior when the practitioner comes to work intoxicated or other issues like that and has an intentional um, reason to harm patients. So we rarely see those two extremes, but the biggest cause of those errors is that at-risk behavior. It's the um, taking chances outside of what we know to be safe practice. So the other thing I just want to mention is the third belief, which is risk is everywhere. We know that risk is inherent in healthcare. We have to have risk. Risk is going to be there. But we can make our conditions safe. And probably, you know, the big decisions for us is what risk is worth taking. And we have to manage that around our values. So, for example, in healthcare, this is actually a, a picture of a baby uh, receiving ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So that oxygenation is occurring outside of the body. Very high mortality rate, high infection rate, very, very serious type of of therapy that is sometimes necessary. It may be the difference between life and death for a lot of these infants, but that's a risk that we are willing to take. And in order to do that, we put some safety, safety measures in place to do it as safe as possible. So again, we have to manage our values um, and manage risk. And safety then is the freedom from unjustifiable risk. It's not taking that risk when we can avoid it. So again, let's talk about what we can control. As healthcare practitioners, we can't control human error. We know it's going to happen. So how do we go about making it a safer place for us all to be and for our patients? We can manage two things. We can manage our behaviors, which we talked about a little bit, and we can manage our systems. We can design our, our workplace and our systems in which the way in which we configure our work in a way that's going to um, help to reduce that risk uh, for error. So just a little bit of um, background. I can tell you that uh, nurse scientists are really um, um, absent in a lot of medication safety literature. So a um, little understanding there, graduate students, we need some medication safety research, please. Um, it's really a challenge out there to make decisions around evidence when the evidence really isn't existing for us. And we have to borrow from a lot of other disciplines to, um, to make that happen. But what we do know is nurses around medication use spend about a third of their time, quarter to a third of their time, giving medications every day. So it's a pretty significant part of the work that we do. Um, what we also know about um, from the work that Anne um, Henrik and her colleagues from Ascension Health and others did, um, they told us that um, that the, about a third of that time, uh, two thirds of that time is spent giving the medication, but about a third of that time is spent hunting and gathering 
right? So who can relate to this? Now I need to go give my medication and I have the Pixis, the refrigerator, the tube system, the patient's drawer, somewhere else, the inbox, right? I see a lot of head nodding. Uh, it's a challenge and I think, you know, as nurses, we have not done a good job in our profession in helping us to recognize what is the safest way for that distribution to happen to us. We um, pretty much allowed pharmacy to decide that the cabinets were gonna be our distribution model or the, uh, the medication, the nurse servers in some cases are the model. And we haven't really done a good job to analyze that and say, hey, wait a minute, what is the safest way for us as nurses to receive those medications, to have them available, and for us to be at the patient's bedside? Right? Because we want to be at the bedside. We don't want to be you know, looking for things and running around and you know, that's how we get distracted and, and lose sight of all the work that we're trying to do. So again, um, we don't know a whole lot about those issues with medication delivery, but there's certainly um, more to go and we know for sure that they do impact the safety of what we're doing. So this is actually some work done early on from Lucian Leap. He was a, a pediatrician out of Harvard in the 90s, and he did some of the early studies that led to that release of that IOM report I was talking about. And this just shows where errors happen, where the medication happens across a whole continuum. And you can see here that the administration and monitoring section for uh, primarily by nurses is pretty much about this equivalent um, in terms of error rates as it is prescribing. So it's a little bit over a third of the time. But I call your attention to the top two lines because certainly when those errors reach the patient, the harm is gonna be more pronounced, but the interception is really where it's at. So look at that. We know that pharmacists catch errors when they look at orders by physicians. Nurses catch errors when they come out of the pharmacy. But what happens when the nurse has that drug in, their, in his or her hand at the bedside? That the interception rate is very low. And that's obviously why we have so much harm at that point in the system. But um, the good news is that is really why we have barcoding and bedside barcoding at the point of care and the smart pumps because they're designed to help intercept those areas, errors at the point of care and as nurses are doing the work. So I wanna transition a little bit now and just describe to you some of those system issues that we see really regularly at ISMP, both through our air reporting systems and also through the consultation work that we do in hospitals. And um, I can tell you, I have the privilege of being in many hospitals across this United States, and um, nurses and pharmacists and physicians are working very hard and have very good intentions to do the right thing, but um, some of these system issues are the things that are holding us back from really uh, being better at what we do for patient safety. Um, so one of our challenges is about weights. We know that about 18% of preventable medication errors happen because we don't have the right patient information at the time that um, the medication is prescribed or dispensed or administered. And either we haven't collected it or we haven't shared it among one, one another. So weights is a good example. Um, for those of you that are in practice, um, do, do you find that weights are also a challenge? Getting the weights, finding a scale, so, yep, yep, a lot, of, a lot of trouble with this. And the other big issue is we are the only country in the world that doesn't use the metric system. So the challenge is, again, around um, conversion, uh, getting that, that information into the system into the, the right column and not putting that pound weight in the kilogram spot in the electronic health record. That's all uh, contributes to error. This is actually um, a study that was done several years ago through that Pennsylvania reporting system I told you about. Uh, roughly 480 um, errors that happened due to the patient weight issue. Uh, several of those you can see about 27% occurred because of that confusion between pounds and kilograms. Um, other countries don't have that issue, but we certainly do. Um, but the bigger issue is about 40% of these errors when you add up the next several lines are due to the fact that we didn't weigh the patient. We, we guessed, we, we asked the patient what their stated weight was. We need to weigh patients. We need to get an accurate weight so that we can provide the medications in a way that are gonna be safe for patients. And this typically involves things that are important, heparin and dopamine and, and things that are really gonna make a difference in the patient outcome and patient's length of stay. So important for us to, to um, do those weights and to figure out a way you know, to get the scales where we need to have them and not use that as an excuse, well, I didn't have a scale, it was too hard to get. You, know, you need to be empowered to say, you know, we need a scale on this unit. We need a scale that I can use, I can uh, be easy for me to find and easy for me to safely get the patient on and off of. 
Another issue with patient information is patient identification. And again, as a profession, I don't think we've done probably our due diligence about what this really is and what this means. Uh, Joint Commission came out several years ago to help us recognize that we really weren't doing a good job. We weren't looking at name bracelets, right? So people then got the mantra they know, oh, we use two unique identifiers to identify patients because that's what's required by Joint Commission. But when you start to ask nurses, what does that mean to you in practice? How do you, how do, you do that? What you tend to find are nurses will say, well, I ask the patient their name, and then I look at their bracelet, and I check it. So, well, what are you really doing there? You're checking that the bracelet that's on the patient is the correct bracelet for that patient. But what you've failed to do is match that to their record that requires that you give certain medications or you do certain tests. So that part of the checking, that comparative to the medical record is often what's missing and often not well explained, I think, uh, to, to nurses and to new, new folks that are when they uh, are employed at an organization. So um, I, again, challenge you to go back and, and watch how um, patient identification is done in your settings and just to see if it's really done to the manner in which it's going to catch a problem if you have an error. Certainly barcoding is helping that. Another system issue we see is um, nurses at the medication administration cabinet selecting medications without their record of truth or their medication administration record. So nurses are sort of remembering. They're running from a room and sort of remembering what it is, what they're going to get. They can get some of that information from the PIXA screen, but not all the information is there. The patient information is not there. Sometime when the last dose was taken was not there, what the patient's impact was, what the, the, the monitoring was afterwards. So all of that patient information that's important for us to safely administer that medication and to select it from the cabinet is not there. So we would really require having um, access to the computer at the cabinet. But how easy is that? So picture those med rooms, they're very small a lot of times. They've been retrofitted with all that cabinetry in it, and you can barely get in the door, much less get your computer in the door. So again, it takes organizations to think this through and say, what are we going to do to help our nurses make good choices and take, be um, safe in their behaviors? And it would be making a change in the way in which we have that information available um, at the cabinet. Packaging and labeling is a big issue. Um, how about, how many of you have been familiar with look-alike and sound-alike drug names and packaging? Have you seen that in your practice? It's a, a challenge. It's a very big challenge. Um, uh, there's not a lot of requirements to the FDA about packaging and labeling. Um, we do actually at ISMP have a for-profit subsidiary we work with called MedAirs that does uh, pre-production um, work with organizations, uh, with vendors, to test drug names, to see if they sound like other ones, or see when they're handwritten they look like other drug names, with the idea to proactively try to um, impact some of this work. Uh, this particular item is a prepackaged item. It's probably the angle of the picture is not that great, but this is actually two 10 ml syringe sizes, both with uh, two different strings of epinephrine. There's a 10 microgram per ml and a 100 microgram per ml. Um, and very frightening to see um, that they would be packaged in a syringe that would look so similar. And you can understand oh, when a nurse in a hurry might grab the wrong thing or not recognize that the wrong thing has been uh, dispensed into the cabinet. Other current challenges, we have uh, products like the two on the left. Um, I don't, I'm sure you probably, even at that image, may not be able to see that the one on the far left is a half an ml dose for a neonate, where the other one is for an adult. So it's how similar those packaging looks. And then the packaging and labeling that we create ourselves within healthcare organizations. You can see, even though that we've got the ephedrine and the neosinephrine, uh, the, the syringes look extremely the same, and the labeling is such that it's hard to read it as it's wrapped around the barrel of the syringe. So um, labeling has always been a challenge for us. And I bring this up because very commonly we hear um, people in the public say after an error happens, that nurse didn't read the label. Somehow that nurse just didn't read the label, didn't think about that. So um, I actually need a volunteer for just a moment, someone from the front row here with a good loud speaking voice. Anyone? Nobody's looking at me here. Okay, Martha. Okay. All right. Oh, you can read. So, 
So um, before I turn the page, I just want to mention, you may have heard about the errors that happened in Indiana where uh, there were six babies affected by the fact that they got um, 10,000 units of heparin in an umbilical line instead of 10 units. Um, and so people said, geez, you know, wh why didn't the nurse, why didn't the nurses see that? And then it was only a short time later when um, there was another um, error very similar out in uh, Los, Los Angeles and it impact, impacted the Dennis Quaid twins. And he was the one that actually said at the time, the nurse just didn't bother to read the label. Like somehow it was a very overly simplistic that that's why the error happened. So um, I'm gonna have you read nice and loud. Is this a test? It's not a test. Oh, okay, good. It's not a test. So why didn't the nurse read the label? The phenomenal, the phenomenal power of the human mind. According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Amazing, huh? Good. There you Thank go. you. So, so what does that tell you about the nurse reading the label? Right? So we all know how to read, we know how to look, but think about those drug names that are so similar, right? One or two letters difference and sometimes just, you know, subluxed around each other. It's really pretty amazing. And so next time you hear someone say, but the nurse probably didn't read the label, the nurse might have read the label, all right? But we have these human factors and these things that are, um, that are working against, um, or our human nature actually are working against our ability to be safe under these conditions. So um, another couple issues I want to mention to you, again, these are newer issues for us and we don't um, say that we have all the answers for it, but we're still learning about a lot of these. And one is unnecessary or improper dilution of IV push medications. So in um, our, our time out in the clinical areas at various hospitals, one of the things we started to notice was that nurses were taking pre-filled syringes, such as um, the, the Carpuject brand or some of the other pre-filled syringes, or just other vials of medications and diluting them. And it seemed pretty random to us. Um, sometimes nurses would do it, sometimes they wouldn't. Some had a methodology for it, some didn't. So we started to ask more questions and actually ha held a national summit around it last summer, just trying to get a sense about what that practice was like because we recognized that all that variability impacts our ability for having reliable health care. If everyone's sort of doing it, making it up as they go and not doing it the same way, who knows what we're doing in terms of infection control practices and in terms of the, the doses that we're actually administering to patients. So we looked at this and had a, did a survey of practitioners last year in, in preparation for the summit and over 1,700 nurses answered our, um, our survey. And what we found was over 83% of them do dilute IV push medications before giving them. Now certainly there are reasons why nurses do that and some of them um, do seem on the uh, surface to be very valid reasons. Uh, for example, those of you that uh, may have experience in pediatrics recognize that sometimes those IV doses are very small and very hard to measure. So if you had to push those medications uh, and do it over a period of time, it would almost be impossible unless the volume was a little bit bigger. So a lot of times in pediatric nurses are left to manipulate those doses at the bedside so that they can administer them. Other times, nurses pretty much just told us, well, Jesus is the way I learned to do it. And then the question became from us, well, did you learn that in school or where did you learn it? And they mostly said, no, I learned it on the job. I learned it when I got to my first place of employment because in school and in college, nurses typically are not allowed to push IV medications and don't have those experiences to a great degree. Now, I know you have the great benefit of having some simulation labs and other things that we didn't have years ago, but certainly, uh, you know, those kind of things are not common practices for, for new grads until they get into the workplace. So it is important to start to ask about that and maybe what you're learning from your preceptor, your mentor may not be the best practice. So it's certainly up to you to sort of question that and make sure that you understand what we know in the literature and what we know by evidence. Um, and I say that to you because again, 
There's a variety of other at-risk behaviors that go along with this dilution, which we're very worried about, of course. And one is the absence of labeling. So nurses told us pretty regularly that less than 40% of the nurses were regularly labeling that dilution after they made it. So they were pulling it up into a syringe and you know, proceeding to the bedside without a label. Now, some of that dilution was being done at the bedside, and we recognize that, but certainly um, very concerning finding for us. The other um, pretty common um, practice that we've noticed lately, and, and a serious one at that, is nurses using the commercially available sodium chloride syringes for diluting medications. And boy, doesn't that seem like an easy thing to do? You have the 10 ml syringe, you squirt the 1 ml out, you pull up the dose into that syringe. It seems like it's perfect made for nurses, right? But in fact, the FDA has not approved those syringes to be used to mix medications. They are actually approved as a device, and there's a lot of things about those syringes that make them um, not appropriate for medication delivery. Uh, many of the manufacturers have put on the outside of their syringes flush only, because again, they know they've not been approved for use that way. Um, other manufacturers have actually taken the gradations off the syringe a bit, because they know that if without the gradation, you as a nurse cannot measure in that syringe in the appropriate way. So again, I would imagine, and you don't have to admit to it if, you're, if you have done this practice, but shaking heads, have you seen some of this practice out there? Have you seen this going on? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, one that we're very concerned about because, again, it's manipulation of an unnecessary manipulation. We'd like to see some of these products come from the manufacturer and come from the pharmacy ready to give. You know, why is it that we as nurses have to worry about that manipulation and induce, you know, the risk of infection um, at the bedside and, and challenge us with some of those other, other things? So, um, oops, I should mention, too, we did produce guidelines from that national summit around the proper IV push uh, medication administration practices, so please feel free to go to our website and look at those. Uh, another challenge that we're faced with now are insulin pens. All right. A newer device on the market in the last few years was first uh, created years ago for outpatient use because of the ease of use for patients to dial up their dose and administer it. But boy, have we seen errors with this. Um, challenges around how patients use this product. They're unclear about if they dial up the dose and they inject their, their extremities or inject their leg. They may think that by turning the dial back down to zero is how they administer the drug. Um, we, so then sometimes they, th or they see the insulin, the wet spot on their leg or their arm after they administer it, and they think they didn't get all the insulin. So then they give themselves another dose. So we've had a lot of challenges around that. And I think, too, there's a lot of practitioners that um, may not have had their full education around how these pens work and really the, the, the benefits and the challenges around them in order to teach the patients correctly. So I think we have a, a long way to go. Um, I will tell you that the biggest challenge around uh, insulin pens is the reuse of insulin pens on other patients. A very, very serious problem. And, um, Patients and, and caregivers alike have thought that if you change the needle, that somehow that was enough, that you could use it like a vial and, and administer it to another patient. And we do know that there's biologic matter that has been tested from these pens. And so the transmission of bloodborne pathogens is really, um, really possible. Uh, so we have to do everything we can to make sure that these pens are not used on more than one patient. Uh, that means labeling them in a way where it's the, the label's not, the patient label's not on the pen, the cap, right? Because once the cap comes off, then the, the pen is no longer labeled, right? And the, we really are, would like to see more barcoding going on with these pens, patient-specific barcode labeling, so that we can be ensured that the, the pen that's been assigned to this patient is also the pen that the patient's receiving. I can tell you there's more pens coming to the market uh, very soon. Uh, the U500 will be out probably in a pen as well as a U200 uh, concentration and a U300 concentration. So uh, you thought we had problems with insulin and, and errors with insulin before. We are really concerned uh, about what that's going to mean for, for patient safety, but, um, but time will tell. Um, this is just actually a listing. You can see there's been thousands of patients affected with reuse of these insulin pens, um, requiring testing and, and other things, and all around the country, all around the country, from New York to Texas to Connecticut. 
Uh, the CDC has a big campaign out uh, around insulin pens only being used by one patient. Uh, good tools for patients as well as caregivers on their website, free downloads and tools. So um, go to their site and, and look at that as well as safe injection practices. Uh, really some good stuff. Anyone know the difference between these two syringes? It was the one at the bottom. What kind of syringe would you call that? It's an oral, I heard it, an oral syringe, versus the one at the top it has a lure lock, right? Now, years ago, we would, or we could now, if you were given an IM, put a needle on it, right? Or it does fit into our IV connections now. So the challenge around this is we have had multiple errors, year after year, fatal events, where oral, I, oral medications have been pulled up in a parenteral syringe and given IV, okay? Anything from Maalox to uh, anything, anything you can think of oral, or antibiotics, a variety of things where nurses tend to use a syringe to measure the dose, right, versus using maybe a little cup. If you want to get more an accurate measurement of the dose that you're giving to a patient, you may want to use a syringe. But the challenge is that these um, oral syringes here at the bottom are not something that are often readily available to nurses. Uh, we ask the question when we're on the clinical units and say, okay, if you had to give an oral dose, what would you use? What do you have available? And they say, oh, we have oral syringes, and the next thing they pull out is this because they don't know the difference. They know that they can use it orally, but it's really not meant for that. Sort of like using a screwdriver to bang in a nail. It would work, but it's not the right thing. It's not the right device. And the challenge around this is this particular device won't connect to an IV. All right. So that's where the safety comes in. That's the fail safe on this type of device. And it's a very easy thing to understand, but often nurses were not introduced to this in practice. And uh, you know, we, we try to make it our, one of our issues, if you will, to make sure that nurses know that there are devices such as oral syringes. If you can't find them on your unit and you need to give an oral dose, you should be asking your pharmacist and getting them available. Uh, because we don't want you to inadvertently um, use the wrong syringe and then connect it to an IV. Uh, the use of technology certainly has taken a, a big role in medication safety in the last few years. The smart infusion devices, for those of you who have uh, been in practice for a while, you recognize the difference that these uh, pumps offer now. They, while they take more steps to set up, they actually have a drug library which allows uh, or protects the nurse in a way in which will alert the nurse if they try to schedule a dose that's higher or lower than what is within an acceptable range. Uh, and many uh, organizations around the country are now starting to use that data and that information to not only learn how often nurses are going outside of these drug libraries, but how often those alerts happen. And it's surprising um, to the point at which nurses have really been taking the lead on the next step to that. So what we've learned is that nurses still, on occasion, try to put the wrong dose or the wrong volume into the pump, and the alert will stop them, and they have time then to reschedule before they start. However, um, in the newer pumps, which are coming, hopefully in the next few years, you'll all see the ability to integrate these pumps with your computerized prescriber order entry systems. So which means that instead of the nurse setting the pump, the pump will automatically be set by the order that's in the CPOE system. So once the physician places the order, the nurse will scan the, scan the bag, scan the patient, the two will be married to one another, and then the pump will set itself. Okay, so think about all those steps, right, that, and all that, that waste and elimination of risk for nurses. It's a pretty amazing thing, and I can tell you that there's a nurse out of Lancaster who's really leading the charge on this and uh, really understanding the value of all those near misses we had with this device and how we can make this device better. Uh, I just want to mention, too, about our storage. I mentioned a little bit about automated dispensing cabinets. We really don't have a good system for storage, and refrigerators probably scare us the most. It's um, pretty much a, you know, an open area where medications can be mixed and stored, and sometimes very dangerous medications, and we don't have a good way to really alert others to the possibility. I show this because refrigerators often are dark, they're hard to see the medications in them, hard to read the labels. They're on the floor. They're small. They're like dorm refrigerators, right? They're way down here, 
and trying to get inside them are difficult. That's not the way we should be doing nursing. We should be able to pick and select our drugs at eye level. That's the safest way to do it. We should get those refrigerators off the floor and get them up in the air. This particular event happened in a PICU where a nurse, a very experienced nurse, um, very well respected on our unit, went to prepare a deltiazem drip, ended up uh, by accident preparing a drip of pancuronium, again, another neuromuscular blocker. She recognized it before she left the medication room, and she was horrified. She was horrified that this mistake almost happened. And she didn't work in a unit where the culture was accepting of those types of errors. So this nurse chose not to say anything to her colleagues because she thought that her colleagues would think poorly of her. Uh, so something happened the very next week. What do you think happened? Same error. So another nurse had the same issue, grabbed, grabbed another refrigerator, took the pancuronium, made the drip, infused it into the child, the child arrested. They did resuscitate this child, but you can imagine the conversations that happened after the fact. And certainly, you know, this nurse, this first nurse was so guilty, felt so guilty about the, the impact that she could have had. She could have prevented this from happening, but because she was worried about what other people would think, she didn't say anything. So, you know, this is again an opportunity to, to feel empowered to speak up when you see a hazardous condition. Um, you know, it is really not, not about us anymore. It's about the patient. It's about the patient and what we can do to protect the patient and to protect our colleagues from having those same mistakes. Distractions, another very challenging thing about our systems and our environments. Um, there's been a lot of work out of Kaiser and out the West Coast around distractions, a lot published. Uh, people set up sometimes safety zones around their cabinets where they put tape on the floor where you're not supposed to talk to anybody within the tape or wearing the vest. And, um, you know, the vest idea is a great thing, except for it's very difficult to sustain. You can imagine if, if we were back in the day when we had a medication nurse and you only had one nurse giving medications to a whole department, you could identify some pretty regularly, but you can imagine how frequently you might be at the cabinet and how often you've got to, to undress and put the, put the vest back on. And it doesn't always happen consistently and reliably. So it is a, it's a challenging strategy, to say the least. But I have to say what I'm surprised about and what we don't hear a lot about is the use of the phones and how distracting they can be. Um, I, I hear a lot of people agree. It's really pretty amazing to me. I've seen nurses with their computers up, giving, preparing medications for one patient, and their phone in their ear, and they're talking about a patient in another bed going to the OR. I wouldn't want either of those patients to be my family member because we're not giving full mindfulness and attention to either of them. Um, and I think phones really do suggest that, and I think we need to figure out a better plan for that, whether it be, you know, turning our phones over to someone else who's not giving medications or putting them on silent temporarily or something. I think, I think we have more to learn about that distraction. We certainly shouldn't be driving with them. We certainly shouldn't be giving medications with them. Um, and just another couple things, because of course, I've talked a lot today about errors that happen in an acute care setting, but nursing happens everywhere. You know, there's a lot of nursing that happens outside of hospitals, and we recognize that, and we recognize the importance of medication safety in these settings. This is a picture of um, Blake. Um, Blake was actually two when he died, and Blake died because of a preventable medication error, we feel. Um, Blake was actually visiting his uh, great-grandmother in a long-term care facility uh, with his mother. And a couple days later, uh, when his mother went to get him up from his nap, he did not awake, awaken. So through the coroner's uh, investigation, what was discovered was what they first thought was a piece of tape in his, on his palate. And uh, it wasn't that he was choking on it. It was stuck to his palate. And what they come to discover was that this was a, a piece of a fentanyl patch. And the fentanyl patches, so we went to the, the further investigation and tied it together with the long-term care facility. What they discovered was that they didn't have a good process for disposal, these patches. So they were stuck to the bedside tables and they were on the bed rails and just found in, in arbitrary places. So, you know, there was no recognition that those patches still have a very significant amount of drug in them when they're disposed of. 
Um, and so we need to think about that. And we've had, um, unfortunately, several deaths of toddlers and children who have gotten into trash cans and other things um, for fentanyl patches and other medication containing transdermal devices. So um, we think about Blake and how we can do better um, just outside of you know the, that typical inpatient setting that medication safety is really everyone's job every place we go. So I just want to take a few minutes and talk about how we as nurses can feel empowered to, to change this current paradigm with safety. And I think a lot of this you've heard from me in, in the last hour but um, just to recap some of the important things. So first of all, we have to believe that errors, um, we have to never believe that errors won't happen. We have to understand that errors are gonna happen all the time, every day, and it's gonna be our job to try to protect the patient and to eliminate that risk as much as possible. And how do we do that? We manage our, our values and our beliefs. We manage our behaviors. We look at those at-risk behaviors and we try to manage them. And we help, we get involved in good system design we are probably the best folks to understand how the work needs to get done, and we also are the best folks to know what those shortcuts are, right? So recognizing those shortcuts and, and coaching one another when we recognize those may be getting in the way of safety. Uh, willingly participating in skill development. Uh, sometimes I think when we leave the formal um, colleges and universities and we get into practice, we tend to think, oh, we're doing pretty good. You know, we, you know, we go to the in-service now and then, um, but it's much more than that. We have a lot to learn all the time. And it's um, very much, I can't stress enough how important it is to that, having that continued learning, whether it be about medications or other things that are gonna keep our patients safe. Um, so please, you know, participate in that ongoing competency and assessment. I talked about voluntary reporting errors um, and those hazardous conditions and helping design safe systems. And just a couple things about designing those safe systems, tying back into the whole five rights issue. So there's three goals when we try to design safer systems. The first, obviously, is to eliminate that possibility of error. Uh, so the example I can give you for those of you that have been in practice for a while, you may recall years ago, we used to have the ability to mix potassium chloride drips on the clinical units. We used to get vials, concentrated potassium chloride in a vial, in a 30 ml vial, and we would be mixing our IVs. We'd mix, you know, the D5 and half plus 20 of K. We'd mix the, uh, you know, the bolus infusion. So we had it pretty readily available. And guess what was happening at that time? Patients were dying because we were inadvertently injecting it instead of drugs like Lasix and other, other IV push medications. We were using that vial by mistake. So the biggest thing that impacted that change in healthcare is we removed it. We limited access, and that's one of the strongest things that we can do is not providing access to drugs that are high alert and harmful if we don't need them in volumes and amounts that we don't need. So that means we might have to look at our heparins and say, you know, do we need all 10 strengths and volumes of heparin, or do we, can we really get away with using the lower concentration heparin? on our unit and only having one strength available. We all know what we have, we all know how to safely manage it. So it's really limiting access is one of the strongest strategies that we can think about um, doing that. Secondly is we have to choose strategies that are gonna make those errors visible to ourselves and to other people. Um, and again, protecting us and, and doing that intervention. And then lastly is helping to mitigate the harm. So that means things like making sure that we have the ability to rescue patients when we give these high hazard drugs, that we know what the antidote is, that we know what the order would be related to that. We know what the monitoring should be, and we do that monitoring because that's what's gonna keep our patients safe. If we make a mistake and we don't do that monitoring, we may never catch that mistake. But if we do the monitoring, Holy cow, even if we gave a terrible overdose, we may catch it early and be able to reverse it quickly and you know, really make a better outcome for the patient. So at ISMP, we look at strategies in a way in which they're what we call rank order because we know some strategies are um, important from a reliability standpoint. We know that some strategies are easier um, to do and more auton or, um, automatic, if you will. So things at the top are like the forcing function. So using that oral syringe for oral liquid medications would really um, be a, a fail-safe or a forcing function in that you wouldn't be able to connect that to an IV tubing. And that doesn't matter whether I remembered that as a nurse or not, it would happen every time that way. 
Whereas you look at some of the things at the bottom of the list, there tend to be the things that require a lot of human vigilance, right? Like remember to be more careful and, and follow the policy and uh, make sure you go to that educational program. All of that is important, but it's not gonna keep us safe. So we need to look at strategies that are higher on this list and we need to layer them on top of one another. Um, uh, just like errors have a lot of contributing factors, the way that we manage safety is to, to layer the strategies. And I just want to mention, I'll, I'll point out here, right here in the center, double check systems. And I call this out for nursing because what we have seen at ISMP over the last several years, in fact, is as, pay, as hospitals and organizations are identifying what we call high alert medications, those, those that cause harm when they're involved in error, more commonly, one of the things that pharmacists often tell us as nurses is do a double check. Check, double check that drug. That's somehow going to, you know, that you'll catch it if you just do that double check. Well, one of the things that we've certainly discovered is that nurses don't all do the double check the same way. Um, some of it, they do it in a way that's really not a value. They hold up the insulin syringe and the vial from down the hall and say, I'm giving 30 units. Will you sign my form? Right? Right? That happens. And that's not really going to help the patient, is it? Or help the nurse who's trying to get validation that she's making a good, he or she's making a good decision. So um, I bring this up because there is research out there about the value of a double check. Uh, Anthony Gracia uh, did some work um, years ago, probably oh, 20, about 15, 20 years ago, about the value of a double check process. And we know that if you're an individual and you're involved in a critical task and you go away from that task for a few minutes and come back, the likelihood of you catching that error is around 80%. So you're going to catch your own errors. But we also know from that study that if you involve a second person, an independent double check, so someone else comes behind you and checks your work, that capture rate goes up to as high as 95%. So that's why we really you know, encourage that independent double check, that second person separate and apart doing that check. Now that doesn't mean that simultaneously we sit together and we look at the chart together and we, we make that calculation together. We do those calculations separately and then we compare our results. And that's what's going to get us the value of the double check. The other thing I, I often see and hear about double checks is again, they're trying to be applied to too many things. Um, one research project which we have not gotten to but we love to is really measuring how long it takes nurses to do a really good double check and how often they may be in the course of their day needing to do one. So think about the nurses that are maybe in ICU that are having to check every time they're hanging an infusion, every time they're changing a the rate, lots of high alert drugs, and by policy they're required to do an independent double check. And we know those aren't happening because maybe that's not realistic, but we don't really have good metrics around that to help us know what would be good practice and what would be valuable. We do, however, um, and for that reason, we often don't even suggest it for sub-Q insulin because in many settings, having a couple nurses available every time sub-Q insulin is given um, is, is a challenge. So we would much rather see that applied to those high alert medications. But I ask you to go back when you are required to do a double check to ask yourselves and ask one another and look in your policy. What are the components that are required of that check? If I'm doing a sub-Q insulin double check, what am I checking? Am I checking the amount of insulin in the syringe? Am I checking that I have the right drug? Do I have the right insulin? Am I, checking the, am I going to the bedside and checking it's the right patient? Do I look back to see what the blood sugar was? So all of those components might make for a good check, but we have to recognize what is going to cause us risk and what we should be checking. Because the value of the check, if everyone's doing it differently, is really lost. So off my soapbox there. Um, another thing that I just want to mention before we leave, um, and certainly that is providing support for our colleagues who make uh, errors. Uh, this is a picture of Kimberly Hyatt. Uh, she actually was uh, someone you may recognize from the national news, but if you don't know the story, Kimberly was involved. She's a 24-year veteran of a PICU out in Seattle Children's. And uh, Kimberly, unfortunately, inadvertently gave a tenfold overdose of calcium to an eight-month-old that she'd been caring for for well, uh, several months at a time, developed a very um, important relationship with uh, the family, but unfortunately the patient expired after this dose. And uh, it really was the beginning of an unraveled life for her because after this she had to, um, she lost her job, she was fired. Uh, 
she had to go before the state board in Washington, and uh, they affected her license, and then at age 50, she committed suicide. So it's a very tragic, and we look at these as second victims. You know, these are people, nurses, who never have wanted to hurt somebody, but they get involved in these situations, and it's very difficult. So, um, well, I should mention, too, the MITS is the Medical Induced Trauma Support Services. Please um, look that up. Have that in your back pocket. Uh, you never know when you or a colleague may need them, but uh, they are a great resource. Uh, there's also good um, work by a, a, a nurse out of uh, University of Wisconsin. Her name is Susan Scott, and she's done some good modeling around uh, second victim and uh, what that means to be a second victim and, and what kind of support we need to provide folks, not only short term, uh, like immediate when that error happens, but then also long term. Uh, you know, we can't forget about the things that are happening to them because unfortunately for Kim, it was really almost about a year after the event when this happened. So it was really a long term um, um, concern for her. So again, what can nurses do, again, to be empowered, to really make a change and to make it a safer environment for our patients? Staying informed, and it's not just staying informed about what's happening in your own organization, but it's using that external sources of information. Those serious errors that I mentioned, they're rare, which is a great thing, but we need to all learn from them. And, and you may wait a lifetime to hear about them happening in your own organization, so you need to go outside to the literature, to things like the ISMP Medication Safety Alert. Uh, Pennsylvania has a great free advisory they put out every quarter that talks about all the medical errors in Pennsylvania, not just medication errors, but all of those issues. And again, you need to stay in abreast of that. I think we all need to advocate for safer practice and be able to coach one another when we see us slipping and drifting into unsafe behaviors. And then certainly, you know, encouraging the research and, and the further study because there is a lot we still need to learn about medication safety um, because, you know, we need the evidence and we need to be able to direct care in a safer way. So just some final thoughts, you know, health is not only to be well, but to use well every power we have. And I think as nurses, we should feel empowered, really, to make a change around safety and medication use because it's, it's what we do. It's what we do. So I thank you very much and take some questions.